We welcome now, please, the goaltender of the modern-day Montreal Canadiens, a man who was earlier this year involved in putting together a play that has something to say about the history of the team and its relationship to this province. Would you welcome Ken Dryden? You think 17 years after you're retired, you get that? <laughs> I think you will. I think it'll be, uh, instead of Joe who, it'll be Ken who by that time. No, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, listen, you watched the Leafs lose tonight. Uh, I watched part of the game, yes. When you watch a game on television between two teams, one of which you're going to have to meet, are you watching as a, do you really look at the shooters and the style of the game, or do you watch it the same way I do, cheering and all those things? I'm afraid it's, uh, it's the latter. Um, at times, I'll sort of catch myself and, and try to intentionally watch something, but I'm not sure that television is the best medium to scout um, a team. You, you can't see enough of the, of the play. You can't see enough of the pattern of the play. You can see an individual and perhaps what he might do uh, in shooting. But beyond that, uh, I can't pick up enough to really make it useful for me. Isn't one of the things that made Rocket Richard such not only a prolific goal scorer, but such an efficient one? I've heard that he scored more frequently per shots, per number of shots than anyone else, although no one ever kept that statistic. But you have said, and you can see, Morris, you can see in, even in the brief film, that you don't have any pre-plan when you're coming in on a goaltender. You don't even know which corner you're going for. It's one thing I didn't have in my mind. I know when we had six teams in the league, and most of the goalkeeper, they used to know all the players that they played against. And most of the hockey players in the league in those days, they, they used to make the, about the same play. They had two or three plays to try to beat the goalkeeper or to, or to shoot at the goalkeeper. Today it's hard for a goalkeeper because, because they don't play against uh, the, the players enough. They only play three and four games during the season. I mean, in, our, in our days, they, they used to know the players. And there's one thing about me and maybe Gordie Howe and maybe a few guys in the league, we didn't even know ourselves what we were going to do. I was trying to change my play every time I had a chance. I, was to, I, I changed my mind at the last moment, the last uh, second. And that's why, probably because uh, I didn't know what to do, that uh, I was uh, scoring more goals than anybody else. Ken, who are the, the, who are the people in the league now who come closest to that ability to, to ad-lib and create as they come in on a goaltender, who are unpredictable? Well, are there I, any? There are some, um, and I think just as, as Rocket said, that, that really is what distinguishes the outstanding goal scorer from the mediocre to poor one, uh, that they, the poorer ones will have one or two moves, and that's it. And uh, it, you, can, you can tell very well now through, pra in, uh, through practices. When, when I'm out there in practice, you often get into very bad habits because you see the same people every day, and they do almost the same thing every day on every shot and it's the people like Lafleur or Lemaire or Shutt that don't do that every time. And that... Uh, and you know they're going to be the great scorer. That's right. One of the reasons I wanted to dwell a little bit on that technicality is, is there, there's a little passage in the excerpt from the play we're about to see in which the person in the role of Maurice Richard, and the Rocket has never seen this play himself, kind of creates a goal and he scores it with a backhand, which was a, another traditional Richard trademark we don't see very much of anymore. All that aside, can you talk a bit about how this play developed and what you and the other people involved in, and Rick Salute and the playwright were trying to do with it? Well, this, this play was developed by the Centaur Theatre here in Montreal, and, and the idea was almost stemmed from what has become a very popular statement, and that is the Canadians are more than a hockey team. And it sort of developed from there, and in what ways are the Canadians more than a hockey team? And uh, the idea was to, to look at that statement, to see, to try to separate uh, uh, fact and myth, and uh, portray in theater, on stage, um, an idea of what the Canadians were and what the Canadians are now. Um, the play basically, well, is, it's in two acts, and, the, and the, the first act deals with the historical Montreal Canadians. Uh, and then the second act is on the day of the game, which happens to be coincidentally November the 15th, 1976, which, on which something else happened that day. Well, we're going to show a bit of the first act, which is historic and does include a little bit with, uh, it's not an attempt to recreate, it's, it's an allegorical play, and, and I don't want to talk very much more about it. Uh, uh, 
just to look at what these actors from the Centaur Theatre here in Montreal have done with a play that is called Les Canadiens. So let's look at them now, and then we'll talk more about the team and the play later on. Here are, here is our three brief passages we've put together, especially for this program, from Les Canadiens. It's 1759. The Plains of Abraham. I'm a... General Wolf, sir. Yes, of course. <laughs> Good day for a battle. Oh. Yes, dear, sir. You brought along that French-English dictionary, Thompson? Right, sir. Good Would thinking. come in handy, sir. Yes. Oh, sir, the French army. That's not the French army, my boy. That's just a Canadian rabble. Oh, good show, sir. Yes. Okay, then. Let's uh, shoot them. All right, sir. Yes. All right, then. Ready? We take aim and fire. <laughs> ah! Good work! Good work! It's sporting fun, sir. <laughs> Montcalm! <laughs> it's your misfortune to fight British soldiers with Canadian rabble. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I die. They, they run, sir. Who run? You've won, sir. Quebec is ours. Quebec? They what? can't prevent it. They can't prevent it. I die. Contented. Papa! Ici. Maudit pas, t'es pas mort. Oh, non, je fais semblant pour pas qu'il m'enterre. Hey, je vais te traîner. Uh, Laisse-moi. Quoi? Laisse-moi. Laisse-moi. Leave me. Pour que uh, c'est faire? J'aime ça. J'aime ça. I I like it. Quoi? Tu penses qu'il faut être un général pour mourir dans une bataille? Tab, no. Tu penses qu'il faut être un anglais ou un français pour mourir dans une bataille? Do you think you have to be French or English to die in battle? Viens t'en pas! Oh, mange la mare! OK, OK! <laughs> mange la mare! Eat of the shit! Yeah. No, really! Hey, quoi? Peux-tu l'attraper? Bien sûr que je peux l'attraper. The one... The one lying down says, can you catch? And the one standing up says, yes, I can. They want our guns. They want our arms. They want our bras. They want our arms. But they don't have mine. They're not getting mine. De mes faibles bras, je te transmets la torche. Porte-la bien haut et qu'elle soit tienne. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Oh. Be yours to hold it high. Maudit pas. C'est un plein genre d'affaire qu'un anglais dirait, ça. It sounds like something an Englishman would say. Uh, yes, yes! Play our key. <laughs> Fermez vos boîtes. Montrez-moi vos tricks à la place. On va voir qui c'est le meilleur. I volunteer for your war. They turned me down because my bones break. That season I scored 50 goals. Je suis pas fragile, je suis un fonceur. Je suis pas accident prone, je suis un obsédé. Mes os sont pas cassants, je m'en sac si je les casse. Sauf qu'avec un plâtre, on peut pas se carrer. Je pense. Don't talk to me about your great players from over there. Ramenez-les ici, moi je vais être là. Fermez vos boîtes. Montrez-moi ce que vous avez dans le ventre. Je vais vous montrer ce que j'ai là. On verra bien. C'est quand je m'approche que ça me pogne. Je sens pas sans ligne bleue. Le goal me tire. Si je le vois pas, je le flaire. Si je peux pas le flairer, je le sais qu'il est là. Retenez-moi pas, c'est pire. Juste près du cercle. Ça me pogne à l'estomac. Ça veut sortir. Il faut que ça sorte. It's a taste in my mouth. Battez-moi. Empilez-vous sous moi comme un tas de scrap. J'aime ça. Je veux. Puis je peux. Stop it. Frappez-moi. Crack. Accrochez-moi. He's a third son. Hello. What are you gonna do now? I don't know. Well, then how can I know? I have no strategy, that's my secret. Where are you going? I'm going to score! Every winter we return in the spring, the conqueror. Boston! 
briefly and come back and talk more about that play and more about that team with two of its greatest names right back. Welcome back as I continue to talk with uh, two of the great Canadiens of all time, Ken Dryden, uh, one of the men. You were the consultant on that play, Ken. On, is that the correct? Well, something like that. I, uh, I helped out Rick Salutin. Um, Rick was the writer. Um, some of the cast also helped in the, in the final production of the play as well. And uh, Morris, you had not seen it before tonight. First time that I hear about it, uh, I didn't know they had a play right here in Montreal of the old Canadian. First time I hear about that. That guy looked like you? Well, and the guy looks like me a little bit. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> the script was well written. I think uh, everything they say in, in that script, it's, it's perfect. It's, it's just like me. <laughs> <laughs> and the, well then, I want to examine the idea of whether the thesis of the play, that, that, or one of the theses of the play, that the Canadians are an allegory for all of Quebec works, because that was act one. Now, in Act Two, which I have not seen, you, you, talk, you said before, Ken, it comes from November 15. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of what we see in the play in November 15 is the crowds in the arena watching a game. Is it St. Louis, Montreal? Yes, on, the, on that night, we played the St. Louis Blues in Montreal. And what happens in the play is that the cheering gets out of, uh, out of, pat, out of rhythm mm -hmm. with the scoring because what they're cheering is election results and, they, and, and not cheering is goals. Is that true? Well, I think what is true is the fact that, that there was basically no atmosphere for the game at all. There was very, very little fan interest in the game, remarkably so, such that, that uh, as we say in the play, it was almost like playing in Toronto or Vancouver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, it was it, it was it was amazing. I've never played a game like that in the forum before at all. The character playing you says it seems funny to be playing in the forum and coming second to an election. Did you say well, that? Um, <laughs> no, I didn't say that. Rick said that. But I think that that was that was almost the feeling there um, during the game. That that in fact uh, what was happening outside of the forum that night. Uh, had an enormous impact on, on the people's feelings uh, inside that forum. And uh, as, as, as you mentioned, there was, there was really no interest in the game at all. And, and it, was a, it was a remarkable night. Um, as, as, the, as the election results were flashed on the scoreboard, the forum became more and more alive. And it just, it, there was a tremendous outburst in the third period when the final results, or, or at least uh, definitive results, uh, were flashed. And uh, as I said, it, it was something that I had not experienced in the forum before. Just before I get to the whole allegorical thing completely, a couple of other specific lines from the program I would like to know more about just about the team. There's a line in the play also between periods that someone says we should get Dryden out of goal and put in Bunny LaRock, the, the French-Canadian goalie, before this game is over. Did someone actually say that in the dressing there room? Were, there was um, a certain amount of gallows humor, I suppose, going on in the dressing room. And there was a lot of that kind of thing. And, and it's, Did it's, someone make a remark about getting passports for your next oh, game yes. in Toronto? Yeah. No, all of those lines, the reference to that, the reference to myself and, and Michel LaRock, the reference to uh, uh, now becoming uh, Jacques Robert and Jean-Pierre Mahovlich, no, that was, but that's, I mean, that's the kind of 
relationship that, that does exist in a dressing room. And when something happens, there's that easy kind of repartee. The, the press have tried. We talked a bit about this last night. I really don't want to get into it again about the, the, your Anglicism and, and La Roque's Frenchism on the Canadians. Is there any tension between the players at all? No, there isn't. It was really, it was very interesting. Last week, I was talking to a, a writer for, for Newsweek magazine. And as has been popular on occasion, there have been um, analogies drawn between a situation here in Canada and a, and a situation in the U.S., black-white. And um, he, was, he was talking ab about, the, uh, uh, about baseball and how the relationship in the clubhouse now is very different than it was a few years ago and how there is black-white humor thrown back and forth oh, yeah. almost, almost continuously and, and what um, in terms that if not delivered in fun uh, would be considered blatantly racist. Um, and he was asking about what the situation was with the Canadians. And the situation, it seems to me at least, with the Canadians is such that, that we've gone beyond that point. I don't, I don't know whether there was a stage at which you felt so defensive and so released from the, the, the defenses that you blatantly talked black-white and, and, and couldn't talk about anything else, and most of your humor was, was based on that. I don't know whether it existed at one point, but it doesn't exist now, and, and it's, it's... Well, I mean, there it, may be a man sitting right here, and, and yeah. I don't want to try to <clears throat> elicit political expressions or anything from you, Raka, but were there tensions that does everything that, that Ken is saying now about relations between French and English on the Canadians sound valid to you for earlier teams? See, it was the same way that, yeah, I was, that I was with Canadian. I was 18 years with Canadian and I don't think I saw one argument between the French or English uh, on, in the room. And we always had a good time. We were all, uh, was all, myself, I used to go out with English boys all, all the time because at the beginning I couldn't say a word of, uh, of English then. And uh, I used to go out with them and uh, there was never anything that happened, never any argument in all the 18 years I was with the team. So uh, I think it's the same way today. Uh, I mean, yeah. we, we have our arguments, but they're not yeah. culturally or linguistically based in any way. Let, let me do two quick things and say, say quickly, what was the language of the dressing room in your day, Lawrence? Either uh, one? 90% was English. Ken, what is it now? About the same. The working language is English. The working language of the team. You okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making any comments. And then I did say I wanted to get into the, the whole allegory of whether the, the, of what happened on the 15th, of whether that was a symbol for the Canadians being replaced as a, as a focus of attention for a certain kind of Quebec fervor. Before I do that, I want to pause briefly and I want to bring out Jean-Claude Germain and do that. I will do that. I'll be right back. <laughs> In pop music, a bullet is a fast-rising hit tune. Join me every week for 90 minutes of pop music journalism. Hit music journalism on CBC Radio. Turn on Wednesdays at 8.30. Hi, Bruno Jerusalem. Make your weekdays more interesting with CBC. First, there's the best in daytime drama on the edge of night. Then Paul Soles and Mary Lou Finley bring you daytime TV with something to think about on Take 30. Then join me as I unleash some entertaining and fantastic chefs on Celebrity Cooks. CBC weekdays are tops. Beginning with Edge of Night, weekdays at 2.30. A CBC Sports Special. 
The Stanley Cup Playoffs. Last year, it was the Flyers and Canadians who battled it out for Stanley Cup honors, with the Canadians coming out on top. This year, they're both back in the playoffs, along with all the top teams in the NHL. See all the thrilling action and excitement of the Stanley Cup Playoffs on CBC.